Hi everyone, welcome to today's live session. Thank you for joining us. Let's go ahead and get started with a quick little presentation. So welcome to PHS. We are an international student-led, women-led, minority-led nonprofit for medical advancement. We do have closed captions. You can probably see the little words at the bottom of your screen as I'm talking. And if you have any more ideas about how we can be more accessible, you can go ahead and email us at info at prehealthshadowing.com. You could save us as a contact to keep us out of your spam and join our email list so that you can see all of the upcoming sessions that we have. And if you want to go ahead and stay in the loop with us, you can go ahead and follow us on our Instagram and TikTok. We have the same handle, Free Health Shadowing. And because we host from all over the world, please go ahead and put in the chat, where are you calling from right now? Um, I'm currently from California, so it's very hot today here. <laughs> And if you're interested in being part of Free Health Shadowing, we do always, always accept student volunteers. And this is actually the link. You can go to our website and press on the volunteer tab and apply. And we're actually currently accepting team members and some of our positions for that are available over here. When you're applying, you go to volunteer, scroll down, team member, and this is what the application should look like. And I will also be putting these links in the chat. And if you're interested in joining our high school training program, um, which is HTP, it offers leadership and healthcare education for pre-college learners. You can go ahead and go to join our team and select that option. And if you're looking to get published, which looks really good on your resume, you can go ahead and publish articles, reflections, reviews, success stories, and so much more at our blog submission section. And because we rely heavily on our donations and our volunteers, we do highly, highly appreciate any donations that we get. So this is a QR code that we have. And if you have any questions, you can go ahead and put it in the chat. It is currently only towards me, but don't let that stop you from having any of your questions that you're going to have throughout the session and just put it in there because towards the end I'm going to be saying them out loud so that Dr. Holmes can go ahead and answer them. And make sure to take good notes because there is a post shadowing assessment that is available for you to earn a digital certificate verifying your hours at the professional page. And that's also at prehealthshadowing.com. And we do ask that you have your cameras on because it makes the experience more homey. But yeah, I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Dr. Holmes, right? All right. Hi, everyone. I see a few people up there, but all the faces are gone. <laughs> um, but my name is um, Dr. Amber Holmes. I am a physical therapist. Um, I am from Atlanta, Georgia. I currently reside in Atlanta, Georgia, where it is also very hot today. It was in the 90s, um, but um, that is what I do. I am a recent graduate, 2019, from Bernal University. Um, I currently work in the school system, but I have experience in the SNF or nursing home setting, I have hospital experience, I have private clinic experience, home health experience, all within my little three years of um, working, um, as you can imagine, because of the pandemic, things got really flexible really quickly. Um, but during the presentation, um, I know it's kind of like a shadow on experience, so I feel like the more that you have questions, the better it will be if you raise your hand. Um, I don't mind like answering questions in the middle of the um, presentation, but if you feel like you just want to wait until the end, please make sure you um, send those questions in the chat. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. And if I can just get one person or two people to just give me a thumbs up that you actually see my screen, that would be great. We see it. Awesome. Okay, so physical therapy. Um, Dr. Amber Holmes, PT, DPT. DPT stands for Doctor of Physical Therapy, which I'll get into a little bit later. 
Um, so about myself, I went to Columbia State University here in Columbus, Georgia. Um, I graduated with my bachelor's in 2016, went straight to physical therapy school, Bernard University, and graduated in 2019. Um, like I said before, I have three years of experience, and I actually specialize currently in pediatric and phobic floor therapy. So I explain a little bit about what that is a little bit later. But um, I have private clinic experience, school system um, um, experience, and the other experience that I've already explained. And yes, that is me in the picture. I am at a. Um, it was a workshop that I did back in 2018. Um, where we helped um, migrant farm workers um, because they lacked the resources and we gave free rehabilitation services in coordination with um, OT services like occupational therapy, dental services, um, general physicians, um, things like that, because they don't have access to health care, but they have really rough um, working um, Mm -hmm. um experiences i just want to give a disclaimer i um said this a little bit earlier before everybody jumped in i am a new mom i'm on maternity leave currently and so my baby is very close nearby right here in the crib so if something happens um i will be just kind of checking in on her as needed so i just want to give you guys that heads up is everybody still here everybody can hear me yep okay. we can hear you Awesome. All right, great. So what is physical therapy? Um, I'd like people to kind of tell me what you guys think it is. I mean, I, you know, you see the definition on the screen, but when you think of a physical therapist, a physiotherapist, what, what do you guys think of? And tell me if you had an experience with a physical therapist, a family, a friend, or um, maybe if you just heard of an athlete that maybe had a physical therapist, or you know, if you even see seen the movie Just Right, <laughs> you know, with uh... one of our responses is people who help with people coming back from surgery, injury, and mobility. Perfect. Yes, I love that. I love that last word, mobility. Um, so the official definition um, is an allied health professional that promotes, maintains, and restores health through physical examination, diagnosis, prognosis, patient education, physical intervention, rehab, disease prevention, and health promotion. It sounds like a lot, but honestly, we actually do all of that for sure. Um, my definition is that I'm a movement specialist. I am... Physical therapy is designed to help improve life experiences despite medical diagnosis. So what that to me means is just like, I continue to focus on the mobility, the, um, the ability for the person to continue to have a good standard of life, um, functionality, things like that, um, despite what they might have. They might've had a stroke, a TBI. They might've had been in a car accident. Um, they might've broken a wrist or an ankle, um, they might have um, um, had a defect at birth or things of that nature. So physical therapy, just like um, an, any other type of physician, really um, see a lot of different diagnoses and there are different ways to continue to um, specialize. So there's um, Public floor therapy, there's pediatric therapy, there are people who focus on geriatrics, there's cardio rehab, there is um, there's inpatient rehab. So there's different different types of physical therapy, um, th therapists as well. Does anybody have any questions about the types of therapists that there are? Um, I mean, like I have friends, my co some of my coworkers are specialists in orthopedics. I am not, I am more of a neuro um, pediatric. Um, but we all have different specialties, so you don't just go to one um, physical therapist um, for just everything, right? So there's different specialties as well. Okay. So the evolution of physical therapy, just to give you guys a little bit of a background, um, it was actually started by women, um, and they were called physiotherapy specialists, and they were they started this. Um, during the First World War, and they helped um, soldiers recover from war injuries. Actually, and then it just became like male-dominated, and then like things changed, and you know, you know how life happens. 
but the education progression of the actual actually physical therapy start out with just a certification a bachelor's and a master's and that all um evolved within like 30 to 40 years and then as soon as it went, it went from a master's to a doctorate just in my lifetime so like when I was in high school that happened so about 10 years ago so a transition and so now every physical therapy program now offers a doctoral degree and I have some asterisks by the residency because they're moving towards that because the more um specialized that we become and you saw all of the um you saw the description here, like we're dealing with diagnosis, prognosis, physical intervention, disease prevention, right? So we're having to do a lot of things. Um, side note, like I have personally stopped a heart attack and a stroke on two separate occasions because we are having to learn how to find out the signs of either one during therapy because physical therapists are with a patient mostly 30 minutes to an hour, sometimes an hour, 45 minutes at the, at, at the longest. And so we see the patient during um, when they're actually moving, right? So when you usually go to the doctor, let's say you just going in for a checkup, you're sitting, um, you're sitting down and they, you know, they take the temperature, take the heart rate, take the blood pressure. They might check a little, a uh, few orifices, if, um, but they don't really see you moving, right? So we check those same things, but after you've walked, after you ran, after you've done a few exercises, right? So we're having to have a higher level of education. And so now physical therapy requires a doctorate and eventually within the next five years, we'll probably require residency as well. Um, the profession is what I like to say simple yet very layered. Um, there are a plethora of topics that you have to be familiar in um, when you're in college like anatomy, chemistry, physics, pharmacology, psychology. Um, I mean, a few others too, but these are kind of the major ones. Which of these two that I've actually listed, the six that I've listed here, do you think that we use as um, use the most in the profession? I'm curious as to what you guys think. You think we use a lot of anatomy, chemistry, physics, pharmacology. Kinesiology is the study of like movement of um, like muscles and bones, things like that, or psychology. What do you guys think? I'm very curious to know. We're getting some kinesiology and psychology. Oh, yeah, yeah. Anatomy, kinesiology. Okay, nice. Okay, great. So kinesiology, I'm so glad somebody said psychology because that is number one. If I do anything in my job, it, I have to start off with the patient's mindset or their mental headspace. Most of the time, that's where we're having to start. Um, old, young, middle age, you no know, determine, like, it doesn't matter the diagnosis, that's where we're starting. We have to create some sort of an, um, a rapport with the patient because you have to think like, I'm touching them, right? So I'm having to palpate certain areas. I'm having to tell them to push their limits. I'm asking them to go into their pain, right? So a lot of people are not mentally ready to do that. They are just like, oh, I just want to cast or maybe can you just wrap it up, right? But physical therapy sometimes is, we're kind of known as physical terrorists. That's what our nicknames are, <laughs> unfortunately. But um, it's just because we're having to push those limits. And so psychology is a big, big, big influence on the profession. And so you actually have to take a lot more psychology classes than you probably think you will um, when coming into when coming into physical therapy. Um, physics is a um, big part of it as well. I put pharmacology because if you work in inpatient or um, even outpatient, you'll notice that a lot of your patients um, are on certain medications and you need to know the effects of those medications and what they're going to do to your body when you start exercising. So um, if they have blood pressure impact, like, you know, you don't want to do any um, sudden changes in movement from horizontal to vertical. Um, maybe you don't want to do any rot um, rotary motions or rotational motions, um, things like that. Um, you might have any questions so far. No. Okay, so um, education and admission requirements. Um, so education, so in order to get, so 
PT school is actually a graduate, so it's a graduate program. So you have to have a bachelor's degree. So you have to have an undergraduate degree in order to even apply. You have to have a bachelor's of any kind. I was just explaining that a little bit earlier as well. You can major in music, but you just still have to have the specific prerequisites. So you'll have about nine to 12 prerequisites depending on the school. And they'll tell you, you need two anatomies, two chemistries, two physics, um, maybe um, three psychologies and um, a few key kinesiology classes, right? So you're gonna need a few of these prerequisites and you can find them on any website that um, like when you go look at physical therapy um, programs. You'll have to take the GRE as 98% um, of the schools still require a GRE, which is basically a test that you have to take um, to get into most graduate programs. Um, basically, it's just like the ACT or the SAT of grad school. That's how I like to put it. Most science majors with experience in exercise science is most like preferable, mostly because when you get to PT school, um, and let's say you're interested in physical therapy, a lot of it is dealing with exercise. So you have to understand the effects of exercise, right? So the effects of on your heart rate, on your blood pressure, on the way that you perspire, on the way that um, you recover, you have to understand a lot of that. Like, so it's not just BMI, not knowing just those things, but understanding how you can form an exercise program, right? Because that's going to be the foundation of how you do treatment. So treatment is not just, oh, you just need to get stronger. Let's do you know 10 push-ups. Treatment is understanding the effects of you know, those push-ups on the shoulder, the elbow, the wrist joint, and how that goes into being a functional activity. So that way your patient can go back to their daily life. Um, also, a doctor is currently required now, like I was saying um, in the previous slide. Um, so you will have to be in PT school for three years. That's what most programs are requiring. Some are hybrid, so they go like four because they skip a summer but most of them are nine semesters or three years of studying. So technically, let's say you went from bachelor's straight to um, physical uh, doctorate, which by the way, you do not need a master's in order to get into physical therapy school. So it's gonna be like, you will go to school, let's say it takes you four years to get your bachelor's degree. You will get your bachelor's and then you will start PT school if you got accepted right away. And it'll be three years. And so it'll be seven years of education on the minim minimally. Um, because like I said, we're starting to push towards residency. Um, the admission process, um, there's actually a portal for physical therapy. And it opens July 1st of every year unless they've changed it. Um, it's been this way for like the last 15, 20 years. And the reason why is because that way you don't have to apply to 10 different schools. So what you do is you... Uh, register with this portal, you pay a one-time fee, and then you um, submit the application, and the application, it goes out to all the schools that you select. Of course, you have to pay per school, like I think, um, let's just say it's 10 or $15 per school, maybe 25 now, um, you have to click, and if those schools require specific things, they will let you know. So the schools that I applied to, there were some that I had to um, submit as separate essay for, but what you usually have to do is just submit your application into the physical therapy portal and have shadowing hours, recommendation letters, um, your test scores, your transcripts, everything that you would need just to um, get admitted. And then they will, the schools will individually let you know if you have been accepted. And in order to actually begin practicing, once you're done with school, you've been great and you graduated, thank you, right? You um, actually have to get a state licensure. And um, so you have to take a state license exam, which in, for physical therapy is called the National Physical Therapy Examination, MPTE. And then after that, once you get your job, you'll be credentialed. So um, that takes a long time. So just like when you become a doctor, you don't just like kind of hop into everything. You uh, you have to take your time. You have to finish school. Then you have to study for your license. And then after you study for your license, you have to be credential. And then um, that's not even included in the residency now. Um, and then you can begin practicing. Um, these, this is kind of like the overall. Uh, what, what, what question do you guys have about maybe admissions or education requirements? 
So we have currently three questions. Feel free to put it in the chat. Okay. Um, two of them are, one of them says, what does pelvic floor therapy, pelvic floor physical therapy help with? Okay. The second one is, what is the difference between kinesiology and exercise science concerning studies and a career focused on them? Okay, so I'll answer the second question first. Um, is a little bit easier. They're actually very synonymous. The only difference is to me is, and um, this is just my personal opinion. Um, I do, most of my coworkers and my colleagues do have a master's in kinesiology. I decided not to um, to proceed with getting one of those, but uh, master's in kinesiology or kinesiology in general and versus exercise science, really the difference is kinesiology is really just, um, it almost, um, is really focused on exercise physiology. So really just like your body under certain stresses of exercise. So exercise science, it would seem that that would be it, but really exercise science is really foundational. Kinesiology is really like the more detailed um, version of to meet exercise science. So more so like what happens when you do A, B, and C versus exercise science is um, more foundational. Like you can do this for strengthening, this for conditioning, this for endurance, this for um, rehab versus kinesiology um, kind of looks more into the details of your body's responses to things. Um, they're really synonymous. One of the other will get you probably the same types of jobs, same source of internships and same source of um, experience and knowledge needed to go into a field like physical therapy. Um, I hope that answers your question. If not, I will try to do a better job later. Um, as far as physical therapy, pelvic floor physical therapy, your pelvic floor, um, this is like a really quick synopsis. So here's your girdle, your pelvic girdle, right? So where your hips are. Um, so this is where your pelvis is and your, pel your pelvic floor is here. And so there are a lot of muscles there, your muscles that control your bowel and your bladder, basically. That's basically what they are. And so... Um, sometimes when people have um, urinary incontinence or maybe erectile dysfunction or um, they experience um, leakage or urgency or things like that, just like any other muscle, if I were to sprain my bicep and I go to physical therapist, the pelvic floor are just muscles that you just can't necessarily see because you've never seen them move before. So you would just train them the same way. So really you would just Focus on lifting, um, tightening, strengthening, um, coordination, um, being able to um, squeeze those um, like the anal fissures and the um, urethra in order to control bowel and bladder. Um, also, um, pelvic floor physical therapy helps with um, pain, um, like with penetration or like um, endometriosis, I've treated all of those before, um, or scar tissue from, um, somebody maybe having a, um, a blanket, like, a, um, when you get, my goodness, the surgery that you get when you get your uterus removed and your ovaries and all of the stuff inside of you <laughs> as a woman, I'm just like, Phew is over my head, but like, if we wanted to work on the scar tissue, that's what we would do. We would work on the scar tissue from that surgery um, or any surgery, honestly. Um, let's say you had ovarian cancer. So pelvic floor therapy helps with strengthening coordination, proprioception, um, just all those things, um, bowel and bowel, bladder control, which is very common um, in the geriatric population, as well as the um, OBGYN, um, facilities that I've worked in is very common with pregnant women, things like that. So it's very good with um, strengthening those muscles down there. Hope that answers that question. And I think there was a third question. Yes, you actually have two more in addition to that. Um, the third question is, are there any program majors that some colleges offer where you can get a bachelor's and your PT doctorate at the same time in one school, like how some PA programs are? So, um, okay, I'm, I'm, so I will be transparent here. So I am 27. I graduated from PT school three years ago at 24. 
And at that age, there were only at three years ago, right before the pandemic in 2019, there were only three programs in the United States that had that. So you will have to do a little bit of research. Um, and th two of those programs I know for sure are in Florida, and they do have hybrid programs. Mostly what they end up doing is they let you get your PTA degree or certification, which is a physical therapy uh, assistant. And then what you can do is apply to a hybrid program, which you still have to have a bachelor's degree, no matter what. Because like I said, it doesn't have to be anything specific, but then you can hybrid over. Again, like three, just three years ago, it was only three programs in the United States. So honestly, um, from my experience, I think it's um, best to kind of just not do it hybrid. Because that way, you know, if you've done a bachelor's degree, you can choose whichever physical therapy school you would like to go to. Um, you know, honestly, if I were to do it all over again, I would not go back to back. <laughs> I did not take a break. I graduated from undergraduate on Saturday. Monday, I started physical therapy school <laughs> and it was a little stressful. Um, I never had a little bit of that break in order to kind of rejuvenate my, my mind. So and I went to, it was a rigorous program. So sometimes I do this good or not, but if you're looking for one, I know there's one in, I think it's Central Florida. So hope that answers that question. And our next two um, questions, uh, oh, sorry. Our next question is, um, what is the best way to diversify observant, observation hours and try to see many different types of methods and physical therapy? as well as tips for essays slash personal statements. Okay, so I don't give you tips for personal statements right now, but we're actually gonna get into um, diversifying um, shadowing hours. So hopefully I'll answer that within the next couple of slides. But as far as personal statements, um, I also am a uh, student success coach. So I actually coach people on how to like, write these personal statements in order to get into PT school or any sort of program. And one of the one of the students that I have coached, I told them that be very transparent about maybe a tragedy that happened to you and the impact on your life. And I feel like that sets you apart. Everybody has experienced something and a personal statement um, that shows a little bit of adversity and shows how you overcame. It shows your resiliency as a person and as a student. And they're looking for that when you're in a graduate program, because like I said, most of them are really rigorous, especially if you're looking into doing anything health-wise, you're gonna have a lot of struggles. And so I think that's gonna be one of the major tips that I give to you is to just kind of be transparent about, you know, maybe something that's happening that you've overcome and that has created, you know, who you are as a person. Um, and, but I will get to diversifying hours and things like that in just a second. But if there's no more questions, I'm going to go to the next slide right now. Okay, so my personal experience. So here we are. I shadowed over 150 hours different settings for a diverse background and experience. So what I did was during high school, as well as during my freshman, sophomore, and junior year in college, I did not do any of this um, my senior year in college, I decided that my senior year, I was going to focus on my mental health. And I'm glad that I did that. So if you're interested in doing any postgraduate um, degrees, please take that time to just kind of just study for your exam. Um, that's just one tip that I would give you and just kind of do all the heavy legwork in the beginning because hours never, they, they never um, expire. So what I did was I literally just went to every clinic that I could find in Columbus, because so that's where I went to undergrad. Um, I would just call the hospital. I went to the nursing homes. I would call my, like my grandma at the time was in physical therapy. And so I would ask her, hey, can I come to a physical therapy session with you? My brother broke his foot. It was just like really convenient. I was just like, can I go to a CT session with you? And so that's what I ended up doing. I just started. Um, shadowing everybody I could. I started asking my professors where it would be a great place to go. I really used my networking because um, in Columbus, there were only about six or seven clinics total, like nursing home included. 
And so I was not able to have that kind of experience until I came home closer to Atlanta where there were more um, diverse facilities. So I would just recommend that if you know anybody that's ever had PT and then now we have this access to um, now we have this access to social media that wasn't around back in 2012, really like, you know, Instagram, Snapchat, these things, they are, they kind of just evolved. And so now I'm like, you could easily just search physical therapy in your local area or area that you feel like you want to work in and follow these people and, you know, maybe DM them, maybe comment under their um, videos or ask them about something. I have had plenty of people do that to me. Um, and I've given advice through my DMs. I have um, responded through comments. And so you can easily ask somebody to shadow. I was, I went to, I actually shadowed somebody and I actually am already a physical therapist. I shadowed somebody right before I went on maternity leave because I wanted to understand how she opened up her clinic. So, and I just found her on Instagram. So um, there's lots of ways to network. Um, during school, I did various internships and clinicals as well. So just like the Georgia Moultrie picture um, here, um, I did a lot of clinic um, clinics. Like I tried to um, volunteer at lots of health workshops and um, forums. I tried to be at mostly every career fair, every college fair, and meet lots of admission counselors and kind of get some information about when they were having uh, workshops at, on campus because you can go to any workshop, it's public. Um, I did that. And so I would advise anybody to just continue to look. Um, the internet, again, is your best friend now. I did a lot of lead work by calling people and driving around and having my mom drive me around. Um, but now the internet, I mean, you can literally like I can literally Google physical therapy in Atlanta, Georgia, and like there would be 10 pages worth of information and people to call. So really, and people are so eager to show you their craft and to educate others because it helps them. Like it helps me. When people want to shadow me, I'm like, oh, this is great. Like it helps me clean up when I clean up my craft and, you know, um, become a better clinician. Um, I only apply to Georgia schools, but there are plenty of physical therapy programs all around the country. In Georgia, there are seven, maybe eight now. There's a new program that just opened up, but I think it's seven. Um, and I just want, I'm a homebody, so I stayed at home. Um, but there was no particular reason other than that, that I didn't apply somewhere else. Um, but there are plenty of opportunities, um, plenty of schools to look into. Um, actually, my personal passion was to do manual treatment. I started off wanting to be a massage therapist, believe it or not, when I was like in 10th grade. And then I spoke with a um, woman at my church who was getting home health um, therapy. And I, she was like, come over. She was like, I have a massage therapist, but I also have a physical therapist. And so I saw the two differences. And I was like, wow, I really want a long-term relationship with the patient. And I really want to like change their lives. Not saying that a masseuse cannot do that because every time I get a massage, my life has changed. I'm speaking more so on the fact that um, like we're talking about people getting back to their normal selves, right? Being able to go back to work. We're talking about workers' compensation. Um, we're talking about people who may have lost a leg, have gotten amputated, things like that. Like I really wanted to have that type of relationship and still have that manual hands-on treatment and physical therapy was able to give me that. So um, are there any questions so far um, as far as internships, how to get clinical rotations, um, maybe shadowing, anything like that, uh, since we just spoke about that? Okay, so a day in life as a physical therapist, um, side note, I'm not going to talk about what I do as a pelvic floor therapist. I only do that on the side. I'm, I'm starting my own business currently, so um, I'm doing that very part-time currently um, about four hours a week. So um, if you want to know more specifics about that, you can ask, but I'm going to talk to you about my day in the life as a pediatric physical therapist. So um, I love the kids. So I treat kids from zero, well, newborn to about 22 years of age. Um, 22 is where, well, 21 and like 11 months is where they cut off for um, most medical benefits for children. And so that's why that age is that is that way. So I work in the school system, but I also work in a private clinic. 
So in the private clinic, this setup that you see here is typically what it would be like. I have a lot of balls. I have a lot of mats. I have a lot of balance beams. Um, it's pretty secluded. What I love about pediatrics is you only work with one child at one time. Um, in other physical therapy settings, like or outpatient orthopedic, you might see a PT working with two or three people at once. That's not my treatment style. That's not my personality. And so I love to work one-on-one -on -one with this um, with my kids. Um, so they have, I have swings, I have, I mean, like foam things. And so what I do is since I work for the, um, for a school system, I work for a county. So within that county, there are, you know, a hundred schools, each therapist, um, is assigned to maybe seven or eight schools. So I have eight schools. And so I have a caseload of children at those different eight schools. Those children can include anything from, um, children who just have a disability and so they're in a special needs classroom or children who just are on a 504 plan which just means that this kid maybe over the summer broke his leg and so now he's on crutches and he just needs a little bit of physical therapy for the first few weeks of school just to get adjusted so I'm not going to see him long term and he's not considered a child with disabilities but just a child that needs accommodations at this time so I see those two different types of um, students in the school system. 90% of my caseload are students with disabilities who are um, born with a, um, a particular defect or have some sort of developmental delay. So what I usually do is I plan out my commute because I have to travel between the schools. So I have 25 kids that I take care of. And so I don't take care of them all in one day. Um, because every kid has a different um, plan of care. So some kids get seen twice a week, three times a week, once a week, once a month, once every other week, once a year. So depending on their plan of care, I just kind of schedule out my days. And just so I can save money on gas and time, I kind of just look, I kind of like map it out. I already know where they are. But um, like when I first started, there, I just had like a map and I'm like, okay, I'll be on the east side of the county, the north side of the county, the west side of the county, and the south side of the county, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, right? And so I would leave Fridays for my leftovers, like people who might've been absent during the week who are sick or um, like my meetings, because I have lots of meetings and physical therapy for peds. Um, you have lots and lots of meetings. Um, so I plan out my commute and I communicate with the teacher. So it's a really personal job. They have my cell phone number. I have their cell phone number because I need to know when a student is at school. I need to know if they're, even if they are there, are they asleep or are they eating? Is this a good time? I, I can't interfere with other um, activities. So I can't interrupt that, right? I can't interrupt lunch. I can't interrupt any other thing um, that is federally mandated by the state of Georgia for them to receive. So that's another thing as a pediatric physical therapist. I really abide by a lot of things that federal government says because I work in a public school system. So I set up equipment meetings. Um, a lot of um, pediatric physical therapy involves a lot of equipment. So we're talking about posterior rolling walkers, AFOs, SMOs. So those are all orthotics or braces for your feet or your knees, KFOs, um, HKFOs, things like that. Um, which are all braces, so, um, or wheelchairs, standards, uh, I mean, anything. So really, I'm sort of a mechanic um, as a pediatric physical therapist. I carry around like a screwdriver, little nuts and bolts and things like that because wheelchairs get loose, wheels get crazy. Um, I have to tighten up AFOs. I have to tighten up Velcro, make sure everything's um, stable. That's really what I do. I do a lot of equipment maintenance. Um, for the children, because as my job as a physical therapist in the school system is very different than private clinic. In the school system, I'm an aide to the teacher. So the teacher says, um, I see a young lady on here, um, Brittany Peters. So I'm going to call you out, Miss Peters. And I'm going to say, you know, Miss Peters, um, she is um, unable to keep up with the students in the hallway, right, with her wheelchair. And so my goal is to make sure that Ms. Peters is able to get up and down the hallway as, and be able to keep up with her classmates, right? So I don't, I'm not autonomous when I come up with the goals for this student, but in the private clinic, I'm very autonomous. I see a student, I see a patient, the, um, the, the parent brings me in, we talk about 
their diagnosis. We talk about their plan of care. We create goals. And I say, okay, I think Ms. Peters needs upper body strength, um, core strength. We need to work on um, proprioception, coordination. We also need to work on functional transitions. So I make all of those goals. So that's the two main differences between in the school system and private. Um, I put creativity on here because as a pediatric physical therapist, there is no such thing as telling a kid to get on the treadmill at all. We're talking about mostly having fun. I tell them to go running. We play hide and seek. We do monkey bars. I do a lot of functional play with them in order for them to gain the strength and the coordination that they need in order to keep up with kids of their age group um, or to help accommodate them for maybe their disability. So um, I, I do a lot of creative things, a lot of things on the spot. I have a plan when I get there. I always have a sticky note on the wall that says, we're going to do A, B, C, and D, but about 50% of the time that never works for my kids over the age of five. And then under the age of five, it only works 10% of the time. So, um, but I always have a plan just so that way for the next bullet here, I can always document and say, you know what? I wanted, I attempted to do like core treatment and uh, we did this, we did that. So documentation is very important. Um, every company has a different documentation system. So what I use for the school system, I do not use for the private clinic. And what I use for the private clinic, I do not use for my private business. Um, but billing um, and documentation are very important because when you're dealing with um, the government and um, public, um, public, um, financing um like medicaid or medicare um is that they're very specific about the things that you can and can't provide and the way that you do provide them and so you have to have a lot of evidence because if um a judge were to call you to court you would need to be able to say like oh this is what we did on february 17 2022 um, and then the next day, the, the, at the end of the day, I do a lot of self-reflection. I give a lot of parent feedback about what their child have, has done. And I also give a lot of homework to um, the parents because, because I'm only seeing some kids one, once or twice a week and kids develop so much quicker than adults because they're um, continuously growing. Um, I give a lot of home exercise programs um, with pictures, with voice messages. I mean, videos, I'll send it all. However they need it, that's how I give it to them um, in order for them to work on that seven days a week so that we can see progress towards their goals. That's typically the life that I have. It's very flexible. I don't do a lot of like clocking in and out, but mostly just making sure that I see all of my clients, all of my patients throughout the week to meet their plan of, um, to meet their plan of care. Does anybody have any questions about that? Doesn't it sound fun? Like you get to play all day. I get to sing lots of nursery rhymes and I have little cute nicknames for my children and um, they love me. I love them. And it's very informal. They do not call me Dr. Holmes. Some kids do, like the older kids, they call me that. But um, what I don't like to do is associate my name with maybe a physician because most of the time when the kid goes to the doctor, they're getting shots, right? Or they're getting some sort of, um, medical intervention, and I don't want them to associate that. So it's really lax. I wear a t-shirt to work um, with some really comfortable scrubs, maybe, um, and I walk around in socks all day. So when well, we're talking about the clinic, so that's really what they, they usually call me Amber or Miss Amber or, um, it, or you know what, honestly, I've been called like Bobo or whatever. So it doesn't matter, but that's how it usually is. You might have any questions about that. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about two case studies, but we're gonna drop down to the bottom of the slide first because I just wanna give a disclaimer about the types of diagnosis that I usually deal with, probably things that you guys have heard of, maybe not. Um, typical diagnosis for a pediatric physical therapist on the regular, Down syndrome, um, cerebral palsy, um, traumatic brain injury, plagiocephaly, torticollis, um, gross motor delay or orthopedic disturbances such as breaks, bruises, um, sprains, twists, um, contusions, um, abrasions, things that things like that. Um, again, that's mostly for um, private in the school setting. If they are in um, a special needs program um, and they need special services, it just depends on what the needs are of the of the. Um, of the teacher and what the parent suggests. 
Um, have you guys heard of plagiocephaly or taught in college before? No, okay. Um, Down syndrome, I know most everybody's um, heard or familiar with Down syndrome. It's probably one of the most um, well-known uh, disabilities um, or cerebral palsy, has everybody heard of that? Okay, so cerebral palsy is very common. It's probably 75% of my patient caseload. Um, they, it's just, it's a broad umbrella term for a student, uh, a, a patient who was born with a neurological deficit, maybe during, um, maybe during some sort of uh, injury during birth or maybe injury during um, conception or prenatal, right? So anything. So it could cause them to um, have high muscle tone, low muscle tone, uh, lack of coordination. It could be very mild. It could be very moderate. It can be very involved. And so they might need a wheelchair. So um, that's kind of what CP is. Plagiocephaly, um, just the term itself just means flat head. So like if you've ever seen a baby with like flat baby head on here or here on the back, it's just from when they're consistently laying down all the time and they're not getting enough tummy time. Um, torticollis is um, when a baby has like their head is tilted. It could be this intense or it can be like very mild like this. And it's just because maybe they nurse on just one side. They continue to look to the TV on one side. They always eat on one side or mom is always on their left side, right? So mom is always holding them like this. So it could be something like that. Um, and gross motor delay is just like kids that are not meeting their milestones. So usually between the ages of 10 and 18 months, children begin walking. Um, and like between four and six months, they start pushing up on their belly. So these are milestones, things that you have to know, like as a pediatric physical therapist. Um, and like if they're not meeting some of these things, then they could be considered like delayed. If you guys have any other specific questions, um, I mean, there's so many more diagnoses. I mean, I've seen so many things, but these are some of the ones that I see um, um, more frequently. So um, I have two case studies here, and I just want you guys to tell me what you think we would work on just based on um, what we're going to talk about. So case one, these are actually real patients that I have. A five-year-old, five-year, two-month-old male diagnosed with neurofibromatosis. It is not a very familiar diagnosis. It is something that I didn't hear of until I met him. Um, it causes severe balance disturbances. He has a lack of safety awareness, impaired gait, or an inability to walk, and decreased functional strength. Um, so what do you guys think that we would work on? Like, or give me an idea of an exercise that you would do with a five-year-old who has severe balance disturbances and continues to fall? What would you what do you think we would do? Or give me an idea of what you would do. Someone has stated, oh, I don't know why my screen looks like this, but someone has stated hip strengthening. Okay. Hip strengthening. Yeah. So that's actually a really good um. That's a really good idea, actually. Um, mostly because hips, hip strengthening is directly tied to the core. And so you need that central stability. So I would, if it were me, I would do hip uh, strengthening. It would be doing functional transitions from the floor to standing and from the from standing back to the floor. One is gonna um, address balance, it's gonna address strength, and it's just gonna address functionality. So I would have him like go to the floor, either through a squat or down to half kneeling or um, full kneeling. And I would have to pick up a ball and then stand up and then throw it to me and then maybe jump to the next block, right? So, and then he would do it again and pick up the next toy, pick up, jump and throw. So it's a fun game to them. We might play hopscotch, but it's him strengthening, core strengthening, and it really helps. So that was good. Another one we have is maybe some one leg exercises for balance and strength? Yes, my favorite. I love one leg exercises. Okay, I have a teether here just for a demonstration. Ignore my daughter's teether. 
what we're going to do is if this was a cone and this was my my patient, I would tell them, hey, let's tap the cone. How many times can you tap the cone? Go tap and then do the other foot, then the other foot, and then the other foot, and then the other foot. Of course, they don't know that they're doing single leg balance exercises, but they're strengthening their hips, they're strengthening their core, they're strengthening their um, legs, their ankles, and their knees. And um, we're improving single leg balance, which is very functional for stepping off of a curb, stepping onto a stair, or um, even putting on your pants, right? So you put on one leg at a time. Um, so these are things that uh, a lot of people don't necessarily think about. So we would, we would literally practice that. I would practice going outside in the parking lot and we would step off the curb or something like that. So great, great idea. Um, the next case study is a two-year-old, five-month, two-year, five-month-old male diagnosed with severe prematurity. So he was born before 24 weeks in utero gestation. Um, he was severely developmentally delayed. He has decreased core strength and he's not meeting any of his age-appropriate gross motor milestones. So he's two, he's still not walking. He still doesn't sit up by himself. So what do you think we would probably do? He's two, um, and he's just severely premature. I'll give you an idea unless somebody has something already in the chat. Yes, someone has stated core and maybe back strengthening. We also have holding the baby's hand and having a goal of them going from one side to the other side of the room. Nice. Okay, great. So um, teaching kids how to walk is probably one of my favorite things to do with physical therapy. So um, yes, so you would not necessarily use your hands. That's a great idea but you might use a hula hoop, right? So that they're holding on to something fun and maybe they're engaged. Um, kids tend to like kind of lean on you for help um, if you're like holding them. Um, that's a great idea. So weight shifting and learning balance and um, balance reaction. Um, that's awesome. So yes, core strengthening. Um, and core is anterior and posterior. So yes, your back is all part of your core as well. So yes, getting those extensors involved is definitely... Um, is definitely um, warranted with this case study. Does anybody have any sp uh, particular questions? It might sound a little boring, like, but it's really fun. Like, we just like kind of throw toys and talk and stuff. And like, I we really engage in like maybe bouncing and different textures. So bean bags and foam rollers and um, jumping on trampolines and things like that. So there's so many different creative ways that you can get a child to get stronger without telling them to do a certain exercise. Um, and it involves a lot of problem solving. So it's all about like the overall health of the student or the, or the patient. Um, I interchange those words because at, at the schools, I have to call them a student. At the clinic, I call them patients. So, um, but they're all my kiddos. Um, if you guys didn't have any questions about that, just a few tips that I wanted to um, just kind of give you guys, um, things that I wish that I knew. I would just tell you to stay confident in yourself and your abilities. Um, a lot of times we can become doubtful about things because we are always focused on maybe our competition or like maybe not having the means to get to where we want to go. But I just want to tell you to be confident. That's something that I would tell you, one as a woman and one as a woman that is um, of color, I would tell you that. Uh, I would say also be inquisitive and build tons of networking relationships. A lot of the relationships that I that I grew when I was in undergrad helped me get to where I am now as a um, as a clinician. Um, I continue to meet new people. I reach out. I am very aggressive about it. I try to form lots of relationships. Um, it's very important. I know they talk about it's not who you know, it's not what you know, but who you know. It's both. But what I say is, it's not about. It's just who you know that you guys can give an equal, um, you guys can both offer something to each other at the table. Um, I would say let your passions evolve. Um, just like it kind of changed from massage therapist to physical therapist. Um, now I'm going more into like um, clinical training. Um, just kind of let your passions evolve, whatever your heart kind of tells you to go towards. You know, if you start out biology, you want to go chemistry, exercise science, that's totally fine. If you want to do that, go to music or psychology, that's also fine. Um, um, just continue to kind of just, what you're usually passionate about, you're usually good at. Um, and then know what sets you apart from your competition. Um, just know what sets you apart as a person, what makes you unique. 
Um, and just kind of hone in on that and understand your why. Understand why you're doing it. Um, just make sure you really actually love it. I have a lot of friends who went to PT school with me or like friends that went to um, veterinarian school or nursing school. And then now they're like lawyers or like starting their own like skincare business. OK, so know what sets you apart and know that, you know, the path that you're on now, like just make sure that is a reflection of who you are. Does anybody else have any um, particular questions? Anything that I might have missed? Or I know that we're probably doing like a Q&A at this point, but I'm all done for my part. So one of the questions that we have is, what was one of your hardest cases concerning process? Question mark. Concerning, what is the word? So the question, the first, it's actually two questions. The first question okay. is, what was one of your hardest cases? Question mark. And then, oh, concerning... Uh, progress. Okay, concerning progress. So, like, it like did they make progress, or like maybe it was like taking a long time for them to progress, something like that. I just want to make sure I answer the right way. Just let her know in the chat. Okay, so um, I've had okay, so as a pediatric therapist, the hardest thing for me that I've ever done. Um, I had a student that had um, cystic um, like fibrosis. And so um, like treating them in the hospital, treating them and like kind of collaborating with everybody in the hospital. Um, like the, the amount of protection that you have to wear, the amount of things that you have to follow a bye by, like not twisting the oxygen cord, not twisting, you know, the IV, not, um, not being able to raise the head a certain angle, not being able to lay the head down a certain angle, not being able to um, maybe physically touch the patient, right? So these are a lot of different things that um, can be very difficult um, to deal with. And as far as progress goes, progress it is directly related to the amount of effort that happens after therapy. And so I feel as if I didn't make as much progress with that patient, no matter, no matter what we did, mostly because they're too tired to continue therapy or do therapy um, services after I've left, right? Because they're tired out because of their condition. Or, um, you know, maybe the parent feels as if, and that's another thing too, we have that other barrier, the parent, which is not a bad thing because parents are there to protect, but parents will be like, I don't think that that's the right thing to do for them. And so sometimes that, that kind of decreases the amount of progress that a student or a patient might see. Um, as far as pelvic floor therapy, I had a, um, I had a um, patient with severe endometriosis for the last 20 years. And so I was seeing her for about maybe six months and she made no progress. And um, that's a little bit discouraging because you change like every, Four to six weeks, I change up my my process and I reevaluate and I reassess. And so, um, having that endometriosis that long and probably having developed a lot of scar tissue, um, it just was going to take surgery and something that I was not going to be able to help her with. Um, a lot of the things about progress, though, is like I said, is directly related to the amount of effort that happens outside of therapy. Because if I only see you once a week or twice a week, you have other days of the week that you still have to put in effort. Um, so I try not to say it's directly like me because you can only do so much in 45 minutes or an hour. Um, any other questions? Yes, another question we have is, um, was there a role model in your life that you reserved and motivated you to pursue your profession? What kinds of qualities do you suggest indicate a good mentor or model? Okay, I can give you I can give you an answer about the qualities that you should look for in a mentor because I'm still thinking about who really influenced me in my life because it was so many people. So I'll flip back to that. Um, as far as qualities, somebody who has a lot of integrity, um, who's going to who's who's going to be very transparent with you about the struggles that you might face, but then also very loyal and just like being honest with you about um, just about how hard it's really going to be. Um, it's going to be easy some days, but you're going to want, you're going to want somebody that's going to be upfront with you. Um, so that way you kind of understand like, oh, okay, 
I kind of saw this coming, or maybe I'm glad that so and so told me that this might have this was going to come up. Um, I will also look for somebody who maybe has a similar background, or um, I'm not talking about ethnicity or race. I'm talking about maybe like background as in same interest. Um, like maybe they had an interest in pediatrics and then they changed to um, pelvic floor therapy. I literally have met people who've done that, and I'm like, oh wow, I'm not the only person, right? So. Find somebody that you can relate to. That way you will find a level of empathy and sympathy with them. And so that way they can always relate to you. Um, I also would think that a really good quality in a mentor is just somebody who's very supportive. Um, I've known mentors for others that maybe didn't show up during their hard times, maybe didn't answer the phone. I've had mentors that I uh, relied on and then I haven't heard from them again. Um, I'm not sure if something came up, but just somebody who's consistent. So anybody that you see there's consistency, just continue to invest in them um, because they will they will consistently invest in you. Now, as far as somebody who maybe influenced me, mostly is my brother. Um, he's not my blood brother, but I call him my brother. He's my god brother. But um, his passion for physical therapy really inspired me, like him just wanting to keep going despite. So. Um, he was not accepted into PT school. He applied three different cycles, so three years. And so he was just so dedicated and so consistent and he wanted to quit every year. And then he ended up just getting in because he started to change his strategy. He was like, you know, there's something that I need to change. It's not my academics. It's not my internships. It's not my clinicals. It's about my networking capability. It's about... Um, it's about who do I know and who am I trying to involve myself with? And so once he started reaching out to people and being a little bit more social and going to different workshops and events, he started to change because they remember his face and his name. And so to me, his resilience is what really inspired me because I knew it was going to be hard to get in. I'm like, man, three times, you know, I've heard a lot of people try four or five times. And so um, just his resilience made me say, you know what, I'm going to push through. Um, I wouldn't call him a mentor because we're we're colleagues, but um, he definitely was an inspiration to my personal journey. Another question we have is, were there any specific parts of your journey towards becoming a physical therapist that stuck out as difficult? And if there were, how did you get past it? Um, just full transparency. Um, yes, I, I experienced a lot of like kind of like racial disparities, which is why I do what I do on the side as far as like, coaching um, other women and anyway, just students in general of, of color. Um, I experienced that um, as far as like questioning my intelligence and my knowledge and like my, my worthiness of being present in the room with others. Um, that is just my personal truth. I will say that was one of my number one hurdles that I had to get over. Um, it was a big deal for me because I had never experienced that growing up in Atlanta. Um, I saw a lot of people who looked like me. And then when I went to Columbus and I left and I went to Bernal and then I got into the field, I started to see less of um, representation. And so that was really hard um, because when you don't see representation, then you start to say, well, am I going to make it? Um, because apparently the people who have come before me did not or there were not enough people who had the courage to continue the journey. So um, those are things that I, I decided to just um, tap into my personal faith. I am um, a woman of God. I believed that I was going to make through it. I make it through. So I just continued to kind of tap into that. Um, I made sure that I um, stayed around people who were positive and optimistic. I journaled a lot. I read a lot of like, empowering books and um just, I just surrounded myself with positive things. I mean, literally, if you were to come into my my apartment when I was in PT school during those times, I would have sticky notes everywhere. Like it took me about just an hour to just take them all down when I moved out. They were just telling me like, you are amazing. You are great. You are going to move the mountain that you said you would. Like, you know, things like that. And even if the days that I didn't believe them, I just continue to believe that one day I would believe them. Right. So um, those are the things that I personally struggle with, but maybe something on a like a lighter note as far as um, a personal struggle that I had to overcome 
was probably finances. Um, I didn't grow up with a lot of money. And so it was a lot, it was really hard for me to have to come up with the funds to go to school. And so I had to work hard and I did pick up a few side jobs. And so that was something that kind of deterred me a little bit because you kind of don't want to keep going because you're like, man, I'm not just struggling academically. I'm struggling financially, right? So when you're when you're thinking about other things, you can't focus on what you need to focus on. And so when I was thinking about money, I couldn't focus on being in school. And so um, that kind of caused me to kind of fall back into um, just a lot of doubt and worry. But I mean, God made a way. So I was not worried at all after that. But I mean, that was definitely a struggle. And like I said, I just kind of poured into people that were around me and just was transparent with them. And I just accepted help where I could. Another question we have is, how common is it for someone in your specialty to deal with malpractice? Oh, um, and pelvic floor physical therapy, honestly, I've not heard a lot, even though you would probably think there was. But as far as pediatric physical therapy, apparently, I'm just now learning this. So it's something that I've just come across recently. Um, within this last year, specifically because of the pandemic, we were transitioning to virtual therapy. And so because we had to switch to virtual therapy, that questions a lot of integrity on people as far as if they're really seeing patients, are they really doing the full time with that patient? Are they really um, billing the correct things? You know, because when you're billing certain things with insurance, then you get, you get that money back. And so a lot of that did start to come up as we went into the virtual setting. Before that, I don't think there was a lot in pediatric physical therapy, mostly because malpractice lawsuits really come from people suing people. Um, like, you know, if a patient felt mistreated um, and that usually happens in outpatient orthopedia because maybe they felt like I'm paying too much in a copay then, you know, I didn't get better in six weeks or eight weeks. So that's the difference between, you know, middle age or geriatric, like pediatric, you see the patient basically until they're like 18, really. Like if I see a kid, I, I, I start out with a baby. I'm with that baby now. And it's been, it's been three years. They're three years old. Because when you're born with a, a, a deficit, it doesn't go away after three years. You, we just have to learn new ways to accommodate you as you get older and so really you kind of form these relationships with parents and so there's really not a lot of malpractice because we all kind of become family another question we have is how was it trying to balance working and pt school and also what resources do you recommend looking into to try to help offset PT school costs um, try not to go to a private school. <laughs> I went to a private school. That's also like, but uh, and not because I wanted to. I'm not saying I didn't want to go to Brunel because I applied. But Georgia, like I said, only has seven or eight um PT schools, and guess what? Five of them are private. So like every single school in Georgia is like private. So there are only two that were public, and so no matter what, where I was going, it was going to be private. So the tuition was literally four times the cost. So if you can go somewhere that is public and then honestly, just take your time. If you're not going to, like there are programs where you can take your time. You don't have to be on like a set schedule. Lots of PT programs aren't like that though. But if you want to slow down, I would. I would take, you know, a semester, take us off another semester. Um, if you can do that, that's how I would try to offset some costs because you can kind of make some money in between time. I was a waitress because it was flexible and it was quick cash. And so I didn't have to necessarily wait for a paycheck. So that's kind of how I offset costs because I was able to generate, you know, maybe two or three hundred dollars in a night versus if I were to work somewhere and dedicate 10, 12 hours, then I would only be, you know, generating that much for maybe a week, you know, because I could only work two or three days when I wasn't studying. So I would say find something kind of flexible. Um, and then know your boundaries. I only worked at that restaurant for like two months because once I started feeling like I was a little overwhelmed, I couldn't get the sleep on media. I didn't recover as well. Um, after like working out and things like that, I decided, you know, it wasn't worth it. So um, just 
know that you have options out there. I did not look into any grants. I wish I did. I looked into scholarships, which are uh, two huge differences. But I found um, like find a grant writer or maybe somebody that can help you or whatever, and just apply for more grants. And there are a lot because if you're a minority student, student if you're a woman, or you know, um, depending on what field you're going into. Like they will pay for you to go to school. I wish I did that and I didn't. So um, I wasn't aware. So um, try to try to do that to offset costs as well. So go public, <laughs> take some breaks, get a flexible job and um, apply for grants. Do you have any future career goals? Yes, I would like to become a professor um, and just um, I'd also like to own my own clinic that's actually coming very soon, hopefully. I've been putting in the ground in the groundwork to do that, um, to own my own clinic so that I can um, service certain people, like a certain population. There are a lot of people that can't um, get the services that we provide because they don't have the insurance or they don't have the money. And so I want to kind of start up a pro bono clinic. So that's kind of where I want to go with that part of my career. But then I also want to become a professor because I want to, again, have representation. I didn't have that at Brunel. And then two, um, and Brunel is a great university, but you know, they're not sponsoring me or anything like that. But just like, I'm just saying like, I wanted to see somebody that looked like me teaching. And then I also want to because I, I also want to teach because I want to I want to be able to embark like a little bit of my cl clinical knowledge into students. I, I don't want to teach anatomy. I want to be able to teach like clinical um, experience, really, because like a lot of my job is talking to people, getting to know people, having relationship with people. Right. So it's not a lot of just like go there pick up this weight and do this, right? It's not that. It's a lot of hand-holding. It's a lot of trust. It's a lot of liability. So um, I would love to talk to some, like I would love to teach people how to like talk to people because I noticed in my profession as well that sometimes we, we have that missing piece and we're not maybe um, as nice, right? So I don't want to be called a physical terrorist. I want to be, you know, I really want to help people. So um that's kind of where I want my career to go eventually in the next 10 years. Awesome. Our next question is, how has PT school advanced and changed over the years? Um, from my knowledge, um, it has advanced to a point where, like, so we're getting to residencies, but like you, we work with um, cadavers, like in anatomy. There is no like just regular anatomy class where you just kind of see the book and you got the frog or the pig, no cat. It's actually a real person. Um, that is a real big deal in physical therapy because you actually palpate on real people. You know, you have to know where these muscles really are and know how they function. Um, that's one of the major advancements. Another investment too is just like the dive deeper into um, clinical research. So a lot of our practices now, they are really pushing for us to be um, research-based and evidence-based. And so um, we have to take about nine research classes in PT school. And now I'm hearing that we're having to do more um, than that because they want us to start being a little bit more resourceful and really looking into um, evidence-based practices where, you know, um, let's say I was teaching a kid how to walk, I'm not going to just be just so creative that I'm not going based off of what evidence has said. Evidence says that they would need more pelvic support than arm support based off of this research or, you know, this, um, this study. And so that's what we would need to do. Um, that's kind of more of the advancement as far as the clinical side goes. But as far as school goes, um, I would just say it's more hands-on. PT school used to be where you would just go to school and then at the end of your schooling, you would go do your clinicals, right? You do the last last year, like call, let's call it senior year. Senior year, you would go out and do a 12-week internship and then get your hands dirty. Now PT school is very different. They want you to get hands-on experience early on. So starting your second semester, so I had nine semesters in um, for now, starting your second semester, you're in the field. We're in the hospital. The next semester, we're in the nursing home. The next semester, we have a private client that um, that in our, in our own pro bono clinic. Um, we're going to workshops. Like we're having our hands in the field very early, so that way we'll be very comfortable with our craft. 
Another question we have is, if you were to go back in time, what would you have done differently? Um, I would have probably majored in music, <laughs> um, not exercise science. I would have still been a physical therapist, but I would have probably majored in music. That was more of my passion. And I actually had a music scholarship because I am a violinist, but um, that's, that's like a whole side note. So just remember what you like to do, go to school and actually do it because school is about experiences and meeting new people. Um, I would actually probably look into other schools, like I said, and I would probably go public instead of private. Um, maybe looked into uh, another university outside of Georgia um, and try to just kind of push outside of my comfort zone. And then I would have also probably, um, I would have probably, okay, so I was, I live in Georgia, I'm from Georgia, but I stayed near school because I didn't want to drive an hour. And I know this sounds like, whoa, well, why does that even matter? It matters because I spent lots of money in rent and I should have just spent lots of time in traffic. <laughs> um, so it did save a lot of money. We're talking about maybe like how I would have saved on a lot of finances because I wouldn't have had to, you know, maybe work those extra jobs or maybe get extra loan money to, to try to accommodate for some of those losses. Um, I would have also probably gotten a mentor ahead of time. I didn't get a mentor in PT school until I was already deep into PT school. Like I would advise anybody to get a mentor ahead of time, like and have multiple mentors, like because um, you want people from different backgrounds um, just to give different perspectives. I wish I would have had that. Maybe they would have guided me a little bit differently. I feel like I had to kind of test out the waters by myself. And I didn't like that. And so as soon as I got a mentor, I was like maybe eight months into PT school already. And I was already just like struggling and crying on the phone with my mentor versus if I would have probably had that conversation two years prior and we would have developed that relationship, I would have felt a little bit more confident in going, going in. Another question we have is, how do you see COVID-19 having an impact on the field of physical therapy looking forward? Um, COVID-19 has impacted us um, significantly um, because it's a hands-on career. I am one-on-one -on -one with a person usually because of privacy in a room along with the door closed. That's usually how it goes. Um, and so you're talking about, you know, disease transmission and things like that. And so it's really hard to have precautions. I mean, you can wear gloves all you want. You can wear face masks all you want. But um, I'm literally... I mean, true story. I mean, kids have literally sneezed in my face. Like, I mean, they're children, right? So they're children. They cough, they sneeze, they like have snot and it's, it's a thing. So that's kind of where I am as far as my profession, but just in general, like the profession in general, it has impacted us significantly. Um, we're having to be a little bit more careful, a little bit more precautious. I mean, you're supposed to wash hands in between patients, in between procedures and things like that. But I'm thinking now it's getting more to like a one-on-one -on -one which to me is awesome um, because I feel like people want that one-on-one -on -one care. And that's really why I want to go into business for myself because people really want to know that they're having that, that, that unique care one-on-one. Um, -on -one. And um, just like the flu and pneumonia and things like that, COVID-19 will be around. And so we're going to have to kind of just navigate that. But um Another good thing that I've seen it due to the profession is now we have access to virtual therapy. I never thought in my life I'd be able to do therapy virtually. And I complained about it the whole first, I was like, I cannot do this. Like, how am I supposed to not touch my patient? But what it does is it, 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 um, it increases accountability for your patient. And let's say you go into pediatrics for the parent, because now the parent has to be hands-on. You get better at your craft because now I'm having to explain it to you, right? So I'm having to tell you, put your hand on this. And so now there's room for education. So sometimes when we do therapy, it's just, oh, I'm just going to touch this muscle and it just goes over your head. Like, oh, she told me it was this muscle. But now if I'm educating you via virtual therapy because you need to know and understand something more, you're like, oh, I remember that that's my bicep and next to this is my brachialis, right? So you're thinking about that because I educated you. So now we have a higher, um, I don't want to, I don't want to use a, we have a higher level of understanding. And so you're more likely to do your home exercise programs because you're gonna show me on screen, right? So higher level of accountability. So COVID-19 has brought some pros and cons to physical therapy, um, mostly pros in my opinion, but um, 
some definitely some cons, but in the future now we'll be able to do virtual therapy and mix it up. And so, you know, I could treat across across the nation. Technically I can't because you have to be licensed no matter where you treat, but um, you know, there's there's room for there's room for growth. Awesome. With that, our Q&A session has come to an end. I'm going to go ahead and share our final presentation, which is about five minutes with some useful information. All right. So let's go ahead and reflect. What brought you to the session today? What are three major takeaways you got from this presentation? And what do you want to learn more about? And you can go ahead and put that in the chat. Once again, if you would like some bit of recognition through your articles, reflections, reviews, or success stories, you can go ahead and submit them to www.prehealthshadowing.com slash blog submissions. And if you're interested in being part of our organization, we're always accepting student volunteers. That's on our website and it's slash medical slash um, volunteer. And we're currently accepting team members, so that is actually in our Join Our Team section. And once again, we do highly appreciate any type of donations that we receive because we do rely on the time of our volunteers as well as donations that we receive. So here is a QR code. You can go ahead and scan it on your phone or tablet's camera and you should be able to be led to the site. And now that we're at the end of the session, the quiz is up on our website and it's a 10 question multiple choice quiz based on the presentation. You have two attempts and you need to pass with a 70% or higher for verification of your virtual shadowing hours. The quizzes are open indefinitely for your convenience. And if you missed any part of the session today, you can go ahead and visit our YouTube channel at Prehealth Shadowing to watch any of our previous sessions for free and be sure to catch our sessions every week by going to our website see you guys next time thank you so much for joining if you have any questions please feel free to stick around and ask our student team Let me go ahead and stop the cord.